Hello, everyone. It's really wonderful to see so many people um, at this very special event uh, tonight at SOAS. And I just want to introduce myself because it's the first time I introduce an event in my new capacity as director of the SOAS Middle East Institute. I only joined SOAS a few months ago, and this is the first event we host under the new iteration of the SOAS Middle East Institute. So welcome, everyone, and thank you very much for being here today. And I just want to say thanks to Roya Arab for being the engine behind this event. Without her, this event would not really have happened. Um, and I'm really grateful to her and to Aki and to everyone who uh, is here today. Uh, the event today is both a celebration and a commemoration. Um, it is about the woman, life, freedom movement in Iran. And of course, the event is happening against the backdrop of so much tension and sadness in the Middle East. Um, but at the same time, it is an event meant to remind us that regardless of how much darkness there is in this region, the struggle for rights, the struggle for freedom never stops. And of course, the event is meant to mark the first awful anniversary of the killing of Mahza Amini in Iran which of course sparked this movement. But at the same time, we also, with a broken heart, but also celebrate the Nobel Peace Prize for Nages Mohammadi, who has not and is not stopping her struggle for freedom and rights even behind bars. And so again, it's bittersweet, the event today, but I think it's important not to let this issue die, not to let it be overcome by attention going to other things, not that the other things are not important, but what we're saying is this issue matters, it will continue to matter, no matter how regimes try to suppress freedoms, people will still do what they can to continue the struggle. And the arts, and culture are very important mediums for expression, for keeping issues alive, for engagement, for us all to come together and commemorate and celebrate. And we thought what better way to do that than not just have a discussion featuring really wonderful speakers and for the speakers who can't be here in person, we have some recorded statements from them. But we're also lucky to have Roya, who is a multi-talented, not just engine behind events and, and a chair of the forthcoming discussion, but she's also an artist. And I'm really delighted that today is going to be my first time also seeing her perform live for all of us to celebrate women's voices uh, also uh, through music. So without further ado, thank you so much, Roya. The stage is yours. Professor Khatib has been a gift to the Zoas Middle East Institute. And normally, I don't do music when I come to Zoas, so I feel a bit shy almost, because <laughs> it's normally academia, so bear with me. Uh, this is a song I wrote about five years ago, and I adapted it slightly for the Woman Life Freedom Movement. And if you want to sing the last, I am woman, I am life freedom with me, I'd be very delighted. Can I have to take any seconds? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, 
check me out Order me round Check me out Order me round Check me out Order me round Because I am a woman Expect nothing of you It's called Gule Sangam. How many of you know it? So all of you who know it, I pray you sing it with me, yeah? Um, so I've made a little visual for you all to enjoy as we sing it. I'm going to sing the first verse, and then please feel free to come in with us when the rest comes. Hatsman, Roxy, I'm relying on you especially. <laughs> okay. Oh, can we do it from the start, darling, from zero, if we may? Thank you. my academic hat on and get rid of the emotions. Doesn't often happen at Zoaz. Okay, let's go. So as our wonderful speakers and guests come up, we have Malou uh, Halasa and we have the lovely Majid Naisi, 
Today we're going to do a slightly different format where we're going to engage in discussion with our speakers. Um, so first to introduce, Malu is a wonderful journalist. Uh, she's an amazing editor. She's a compiler of up to five books on the Middle East. So she's really quite remarkable, the work she's done. And this book, which you can buy later, as you can see, I've been reading through it properly and revising it. I can tell you that it's made up of really brilliant uh, series of writings from the personal perspective to the theoretical perspective. So it covers a lot of different ground in one book. But the key here is about expression and want to freedom. And I must tell you, some of my favorites were the anonymous letters from Iran. Yes. I found those amazing and very telling. So this is our lovely Malou. And we also have the wonderful Majid Naisi, who has just, he's, he's an amazing documentary filmmaker who's worked on a series of especially war-ridden areas he's worked on. And if you go on to the BBC iPlayer, you will find Inside the Iranian Uprising, a very brilliant piece of work. Now, both these books, uh, the book and this um, wonderful documentary film that I'm speaking of, who we have... It. By the way, Vali Mahluji sends his deepest apologies. He was going to be here to talk about the LGBTQ plus part and consequences with this, but we will have a presentation from him. And any of the speakers who are not here, we can give you their email addresses if you've got any particular questions you'd like to ask. So we're going to start all this off with asking both of you a very similar question about the selection process and the challenges, because you actually found a series of writers to write for you, and Marjit actually sat and looked through hundreds of hours of news broadcasts and online, uh, as you know, the online presence is one of the most important ways of accessing information. So can you please tell us a little about the selection process. How did you select your people? I've done two books previously on Iran. The first was, it was an anthology with Mazyar Bahari, and that came out, uh, Transit Tehran, Young Iran and Its Inspirations in 2009. Before that, I worked with Hengame Golestan on a monograph about her husband, uh, Kave Golestan, the, the very well-known uh, documentary photographer. So there are people in, in Tehran who, who know my work. And um, I was told of many different writers that I approached, and some of them did not know me. And because they did not know me, at first they said, we're willing to, we, yes, we, we want to write for this anthology, but we're also afraid to use our names because we'll be tar we, we might be targeted by the regime. But as my friends or people that I've worked with or people that I've published in Tehran before vouch for me, uh, the writer, some of the writers that I approached said, no, you can use my name. Now, our book opens, uh, Woman Life Freedom opens with an anonymous letter and closes with an anonymous, anonymous letter by the same writer um, who really did want to keep their anonymity. Um, and I, as an editor, especially because of the politics of, for artists and writers and filmmakers in Iran, people have to be careful. So I had no problem with anonymity, and I wanted, I, I really wanted the book to be a platform for the, not only the theory, but the voices and the art that's coming out of the woman life movement. So to make this platform, you had to be flexible. And um, a lot of material came in. If it, it, the book could have been bigger, and I think that that was really, uh, when you say about the problem of selection, originally the publisher said you could have 18 contributors, and um, I gave them over 50. So it was, um, I, I tried to open the book even wider. And, and Saki is a Middle Eastern, uh, Middle East publishers, so they understood exactly what I was doing, and, and in the end they were very supportive of it. But also we wanted to have voices. One of the main thing in, in a lot of my anthologies is that I like to have established voices, but unestablished voices. 
because I feel that the people who are coming up have a different perspective from those who've been writing or working for a long time. And so it's, it's really to get that balance. But I try to bring in every, whoever I could bring in, I, I tried to bring them in. Well, you did a great job of it. And Majid John, how did you yeah. choose from all these hundreds of hours of, of footage yeah. what you put in? It's, it's like a, oh yeah. Hi to everyone. It's like a nightmare, really. Is <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, after 16th of September, I put myself in the. I go to my room office at home, and it became for me like a cell because I cannot move. Is the social media full of lots of footage? And you cannot do anything. And of course, you are far as a documentary filmmaker. Or, or I'm always being inside the happening. You know, everything happening. I was there. My camera was there in front line. I don't know in this country, that country. This is the first time I'm not there, and I cannot do anything. And that was for me is a really nightmare. But. I, I said myself, I have to do something. But what? I didn't know. What is that? Then I started to download any footage came out from any social media I can find in that time. I can tell you really like a 20 hours a day working, sleeping in the same room, wake, working, sleeping. And then for after a few months, I found myself in the middle of the hundreds hour of rushes and then I said okay now is the time to to go ahead and make this film but it was been only social media then with the team and the group you know because the film is a little bit uh, there is a team working you know all of this thing then we decide how to tell the story because we have to tell a very simple story. And what the reason of that film? The reason of that film for me, it, we give the voice to the people inside Iran, to the people, the foreigners, they don't know about Iran. Because all the Iranians know their story, you know, <clears throat> and know the story also. And we try to make it as simple as possible to give the like a narrative story from the first day until 2003, what happened in Iran. That's why then we choose three characters and lots of interview inside Iran. Now, one thing I did forget is my slight of thing. We actually have a very wonderful presentation from Nader Chamlu, who has worked for the UN. And perhaps we will play you that film because it will give you some perspective and some wider understanding of the impact and the issues that have arisen on this. So if I may be so bold as to play this film uh, by Nader Chamlu, who will be very honored actually to agree to take part in this. But I will need the lovely help of the gentleman. Ah, here is, are we there? My apologies, technical stuff is not my forte. Thank you so much, Patrick. Could you come please put this charm in this presentation? And what has the Iranian opposition learned from the by now 13 months old women's life freedom movement? And what must we do more in the future? Greetings to Ruta Shoma. Uh, I am not a Sham, living firmly with the World Bank and now with the Atlantic Council. I thank for the invitation to this very important event and the regret that I'm not there in person since I would certainly have benefited greatly from the exchange of views. The tragic death of Mahsan Shina Amini erupted the most broad based political movement since the 1979 revolution. Iranians everywhere set aside initially ideological differences which had for so long fragmented the, the community and joined hands in a renewed and energized campaign to change the regime or at least radically change its behavior. 
citizens, artists, influencers, and officials from and in diverse countries supported the struggle for women's equality in unprecedented ways. Among them, the Grammy to Shermin Hajipur's song, Baraye, or the Nobel Prize uh, in Peace to Nargesa Mohammadi in honor of the Women, Life, Freedom Movement. I believe that it was the first time in Nobel history to award the prize for a second time to the same cause in the same country in 2003 to Dr. Shirin Ebadi, and now again to Nargesa Mohammadi. I count among the movement's successes its ability to change the image of young Iranians around the world. Instead of the somber and harsh face that the Islamic Republic has projected since 1979, uh, the world saw a generation of modern, dynamic, open, freedom-loving, sophisticated people, and it sympathized with that. Another gain has been the initial flurry uh, of debates about what values we want to see in a future Iran. And let us not forget that the brutality of the regime has also led to a steady erosion of regime supporters, or at least a distancing or a revaluation of their early beliefs. But why could uh, such a broad-based movement not yet deliver more tangible results? Beyond the unparalleled brutality of the regime in suppressing any kind of protest, I see two problems. First, while women's equality is a deserving goal in itself, it seems to be still seen as a zero sum game, a belief that what women gain is at the expense of others, though dismantling this and discrimination benefits all and delivers a gender dividend. Second, uh, though the movement is called Women, Life, Freedom, it may have been pushed to the back burner by old ideological struggles about what type of and what shape of Iran's uh, future government should be, should it be monarchy or republic, and in either case, which form of, of uh, monarchy and republic. Okay, let me begin with what I call the gender dividend and allow me to share some trends that Iranians would certainly want to see reversed in the future. The first is Iran's global economic standard, uh, standing as measured by its share of global GDP. The IMF uh, data, Iran's share declined from 1.8% in 1980 to 0.8% today, less than half of what it used to be. Over the same period, two of Iran's comparators here, Turkey and, and Korea, achieved a continuing and steady rise. Iranians would certainly want to see an economically more powerful country in the future. And with the right policies, that is possible. A second challenge is citizens' welfare. And this figure depicts average income and wealth since 1950 and how it increased before the revolution and how it dropped sharply and stayed flat since then. Increasing average income will naturally be among the important expectations in the future. High income inequality is another source of discontent. The red line in this figure shows the share of pre-tax national income of the top 10%, and the blue line is the share of the pre-tax income of the bottom 50%, a huge gap. Additionally, nearly one in every three Iranians has fallen below the national poverty line in recent years, creating opportunities for people to move out of poverty and narrowing income inequality will be among the persistent expectations in the years and decades to come. Now, what could women's equality do for all of these economic challenges? My answer is a lot, and I refer to a series of outstanding cross-country analyses that the IMF has conducted, which have found strong linkages and at times direct robust causations between gender equality and key economic outcomes. 
And uh, here is the list in case you're interested, but among the studies are that, uh, that gender equality has economic gains and boosts growth and stability. More equal laws boost women's economic participation, which tackles income inequality. It impacts firm performance, and it has shown to increase industrial and export diversification. In the words of Christine Lagarde, then IMF chief, women boost the bottom line for home, firm, and country. And these have direct relevance for the economic challenges that Iran faces. To demonstrate this point further for Iran, a 2017 IMF report estimated that better female economic participation could boost Iran's GDP by 40%. Imagine that, a 40% average increase for every Iranian. This is what I call the gender dividend. But today, women's economic participation in Iran is at 15.5%, one of the lowest in the world. And what keeps it low are many legal barriers that limit uh, women's access to opportunity. The World Bank's uh, Women, Business and Law found that Iran has among the highest legal barriers for women's participation, 23 more hurdles than men, and that these barriers are over and above the discriminatory family laws, such as the right to divorce or child custody, that women activists have been fighting for decades. Hence, the strong empirical evidence from cross-country analysis suggests that gender equality benefits everyone, not just women, and therefore is central to development and prosperity. The World Economic Forum's uh, Gender Gap Report ranks Iran 143 out of 146 countries, so nearly at the bottom. We face a mountain of discrimination that must be dismantled, not just for the sake of women, but for the sake of all Iranians. What is at stake goes beyond the job. It is for the future of Iran. Now to my second point. What is happening in the opposition? Initially, all groups rushed to profess to women's rights. But in recent months, ideological dividing lines have reappeared, such as should Iran be a republic or a monarchy, and which type under each, under each heading. As a result, all feuds have resurfaced. If women life freedom comes up, it is a window blessing. Most often, it is left out. Here, I share two such sessions by either side that is rather main dominated. Women who are active in the opposition are either absent on the front lines or have chosen to fight on the ideological sides. I have witnessed fierce exchanges among the women from opposite camps who would otherwise agree on the topic of women's rights. Hence, if women like freedom may have lost its fervor Women bear part of the blame themselves. Putting ideology ahead of women's rights is precisely the mistake Iranian women made in 1979, such as fighting imperialism was more important than, than their own rights. We know how it ended. It must not, not be repeated. Regardless of the nature of a future government, women across all political stripes must be united to dismantle the system of gender apartheid. That was amazing. Yeah, that was amazing. <coughs> that was quite shocking, yeah, the statistics, very really shocking. <laughs> revolution because the hijab was taken as a way of standing out against imperialism because in the um, Reza Shah's time around the time of Ataturk when they were trying to secularize the region they actually tried to force the hijab off people's heads 
So this idea of hijab has had this going backwards and forth. And in this particular clip, she actually has some very powerful women saying, we'll wear the hijab if it means that the Westerners realize we're not part of the imperial powers to be. So this hijab has had this up and down problem for a very long time. Yeah. And it's a really key issue because they literally, even very modern women, agreed to wear the hijab simply based on the fact that we'll see now. My apologies, it didn't happen. So basically, the, the point being that you see very powerful women who are like from the left wing, from Democratic Party, saying, we will wear the hijab if that means that we make a point to the West, that we are not going to be part of the imperial process. So my apologies for that, but there is a lot of, on that, you will find, if you look up 1979 Revolution, women for the hijab, you will find a lot of people who you wouldn't expect to speak up, but they did. Because it, it, this hijab is, what's really interesting in Iran, in Iran is there's people who want to keep their hijab. So this woman life freedom, uh, will just, this woman whole woman life freedom thing goes beyond the hijab. It, this has become a symbolic fight and a struggle, which actually uh, brings me to this question of eco economics. Because clearly, economy is one of the major driving forces behind this. We not only have a very corrupt government, we have a very wealthy nation, and at the same time, as you saw, the wealth is very badly distributed. And um, I, I actually saw in your film, mind it was really interesting. One of the teachers, sort of, uh, one of the teachers cussing the student, saying, "What are you talking about? Do you think that uh, taking off the hijab will fix the problem of your uh, of your economy?" <coughs> so, economy became a key factor in this. So, I. I and, I'd like you to speak a little about that, both of you, what you found with your research to do with the problem with the economy and how that is feeding into uh, the movement. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, is the hijab, as we know, is the, like a symbol of this movement, but there is lots of behind this hijab. It's day by day grew up, lots of story as economic, as we know, for many years, you know, we have a very young uh, generation in Iran, you know. They are all looking for work, they are all looking for uh, better life, but day by day, because of the, sorry for my English is not good, uh, I apologize, yeah. because of the, the government always, they make a wrong, mistake, uh, wrong decision, wrong thing, you know, is it like a dictatorial government. They, they, they have their ideology. They really don't, don't care about the, the like uh, these huge young people, and they, they all not have a work, don't have anything. That's why the one of the reason of the, not this movement. Few years before that, also a start other movement. That is a start because of the petrol is. The price came out three years before that, I think, and the government in few days they killed something like uh, 1,500 people, and they arrest lots of lots of people until no lots of people they we don't know their name, you know, and that is more happening in the like a poor city and poor country because a uh, poor city and small country and as in, in Tehran too, you know, but is it, that what we say is that when it's arrived to the woman life freedom, is the woman life freedom is the, like a last thing, you know, because it's like a lots of a story, economic, political, lots of things behind uh, this, this movement now we see, yeah. And in your essays, in your contributions, what did you find? In the, in the essays themselves, people were not talking about a lack of opportunity. But I was very interested when I was working with, there's a, a, there a group online, there's a collective called Iranian Women of Graphic Design. And we went to their open access drive. They, they 
I found them very interesting because they told me that they, they run an open access drive that artists inside Iran, artists from around the world, upload their images that they are, have made in support of the Woman Life Freedom Movement and that protesters can download the images, print them out, and take them on demonstrations. But the reason why this group uh, came together initially was because there had been a book published of a hundred years of Iranian graphic design. And in a hundred years, they only showed five women, five women graphic designers. And this group formed because they wanted to show the work of women graphic designers. But as the woman life freedom movement started and took off, they were, they were in conversation with graphic designers around the world. And they decided that they didn't want their open access drive to only show the work of Iranian graphic women designers. They wanted, they wanted queer designers. They wanted male designers. They wanted trans designers. They wanted international designers. And I think that was the first inkling that I really understood that the hijab was, yes, it's a piece of cloth, and of course it means that women do not, women are invisible in a way, that they, that their opportunities have been curtailed because they are women. But definitely in the 1979 revolution, this is from my own research in the 1979 Islamic revolution, there were secular women who wore the chador, because they wanted to support the revolution against, they wanted to overthrow the, the Shah. The imperialists. They wanted to overthrow the Shah. But this, but and women were very active during the 1979 revolution. But what women did not realize was that a few weeks after Khomeini came to power and the Islamic and the Islamic Republic was formed that their laws, the family laws, their rights under certain family laws under the Shah were rescinded. And there's a, in, in our book, we have the, the photographs of the mass women's marches against compulsory uh, uh, veiling. And, and, and this takes place around, it, it takes, and, and Vali has talked about it, that it takes place um, March 8th, 1979. That was International Women's Day. There were a series of marches because the women had been told that they were going to have to wear the hijab. And you can see in the photographs by Hengabe Golestan, they're, they're iconic black and white photographs that we reproduce in the book. You can see the women are very angry because they fought so hard for the revolution and they had been told by Khomeini that they would not lose their yeah. rights. And, at like, and it's almost like I think that the revolution, the republic was formed sometime during February 1979. And by the 8th of March, women were losing their rights. So it's this, it, it's very interesting how, women, uh, how women's bodies, women's rights became a canvas on which ideologically, these, these ideological changes were made. I will say here that in Iran, the men are also restricted somewhat in what they can wear. So a man can't walk around in shorts and a sleeveless top either. So to be fair, this hijab is for both of us in one way or another. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about is the regional powers. Because one of the things that struck me in two of the... First of all, in the first essay, the lady turns around and says something that really scares me, but is really flaming true. Um, it says, the Islamic Republic, after more than four decades of practice, has not necessarily perfected, but rather learned the art of allowing for seismic activity, sometimes tectonic in scale, in order to preempt something far larger of magnitude. They know how to stay in power, basically. And that same author then goes on to say, basically, she doesn't see the regime being changed. And that's the reality. That's the reality on the ground. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? That is the um, anonymous author that opens and closes the book. And even though this author feels that at this time, they don't see, she doesn't see regime change, 
she does believe that something seismic has occurred and that before woman life freedom, people didn't really think that there could be a change in the regime. And now, during the, the protests and, and at this time now, people think that there might be a change, but they don't know when it will come. And I think that has to do with what we were hearing about that the, the actual opposition is that they're fighting. And that's the one thing that I have noticed among working, uh, not among my contributors for the book, because they've been incredible, but in political gatherings, Iranian political gatherings, there is a lot of animosity and a lot of um, uh, pe people feel very much that they fight their corner. And I really have to go back to what Maziar Bahari was talking about. Maziar runs Iran Wire. And Maziar said that what's important now is that Iranians start talking among themselves with each other. Instead of blaming everybody, everyone has to sit down and talk. Because this is a problem. Whilst the Islamic Republic has consolidated its position fully and very firmly stayed in power, the actual uh, opposition groups outside Iran have absolutely minimal unity, and that became really clear. Anything to say about yeah, that? Yeah, I'm, I'm only saying about uh, the government not changed. This is really last night one of the... Uh, my mom of one of my friends, she's just come from Iran. And I asked her, okay, what is now, you know, is as a... Uh, she said, look, we win, the bot we win the war now. I say, but the government is still the same thing. She said, yeah, the government is still the same thing, but we are one step further. That means... We are, didn't lose this battle, but it's not always when you want to win the battle that means the government is changed or anything else happened. It will happen little by little, maybe. I wanted to share that yeah. with you only because it's very powerful. She believed that it, there, is, there is now change, you know. They, they killed lots of people, you know, but it's like a one step further. And as she said, the people start to speak, start to think, and start to think about the future and their relation with this kind of... Uh, also, another thing, I think the people in the West and everyone has to realize is that Iran now has the most incredible surveillance going on inside their cities, on their streets. I mean, uh, in the introduction for the book, uh, a friend of mine had just returned from one of the smaller cities, and he related to me a conversation around the dinner table um, when the whole family was together. And his brother was talking about the cabbies that take a woman who's unveiled, who, who ferries an unveiled woman to a place. They get a call on their mobile phone, a warning from the government. The government can see who they are through their license, the, uh, the, the license plate on their car. And they have their numbers. They call them up. And they, they warn them that this is your first warning. The second warning, they get a fine. The third warning, maybe they're taken to court and their car is confiscated. I heard a statistic that 100,000 cars have been confiscated. So I mean, we're we're talking about a uh, we're talking about a country that's that has high surveillance. CNN reported that they're using AI in in, in facial recognition, and also also in the book, um, graffiti I always find is a very important way of, of judging or gauging a place. What's going on with graffiti artists? Um, and when the protests were high and People, and women were being killed during these protests and men were being arrested and some of them have been executed. A socialist youth group went out and documented the graffiti on the streets. They went out on the streets and they had to cover their faces and they had to go at night and they had to, to take care because the people who do the graffiti, if they're picked up, they can be killed. The people who document the graffiti, they can be arrested 
bad things can happen to them. So we're asking a country or we're expecting regime change in a country where the people, the heavy hand of surveillance, in a way that we don't understand yet here, yeah, yeah. is there. That actually brings me to a thought because just, I mean, China is famous for its uh, surveillance methods, and I wouldn't be surprised if half of this stuff came from China. It does. And it is remarkable that a few months into the woman life freedom, China stood, shook hands with Iran, and said, we're trading with them, we're buddies. Next minute they go, oh, Iran has lithium. Next minute they go, oh, we're going to open up the biggest factory. <laughs> then we have Saudi Arabia, who's Iran's long-term nemesis, actually shake hands. And it really made me think about the fact that this woman life freedom is about political freedom, it's about civil rights, it's about human rights. None of our neighbors want that. The Islamic neighbors we've got, none of us want the women without hijab. And as for Russia and China, the last thing they want is civil liberties and human rights. So this I, because this is something also came up in your book no, from no. that anonymous one I love. At the end, she says, to, to actually look at this in the prism of Iran is wrong. You have to look at what is going on around Iran because that is feeding into Iran's abuse of power. So, But also that even though you have this heavy surveillance going on inside the country, you also have these tech activists inside the country and outside the country. And one of the writers that we have in our, our, in our, one of the contributors, her name is Ashley Bellinger, and she's an investigative reporter for Ars Technica, which is the technical, the, the tech magazine that covers the latest trends, and it's owned by Condé Nast. And her article about Iran is one that Jasmine Green, who is Iranian, who's at uh, Google Alpha uh, Jigsaw, uh, she tweeted about. And it's very important that we watch the tech activists and what they're doing and what they're calling for to help Iran. But what about the problem we've got in Iran that we cannot solve our problems alone and the people who might be able to help us are doing the exact contrary? So how do we place Iran within the political games and machinations that are going on in the region and in the wider world? This is, would you agree? I mean, is this? Yeah, no, no, the, the, I think that is right. Is we are in the middle of the lots of different uh, political thing. But the, it's, it's hard to, to, I think how to, can say it, yeah, yeah you know, because, uh, you know, it's, we have a different country around us, but I don't want to say it's like the Iranian, they have a different culture with other country they have, you know. But as we know, the Islamic uh, culture in Iran is like a traditional, but is not like a, a not like a yes, so not it's a tradition, it's, it's a cultural thing. So sometimes yeah. without the religion, you can have some of the traditional life ways. Yeah, but in the country around us, you know, I, I want to sh shift to that. The country around us is usually the Islamic, uh, for them, is like a, not only traditional in the way of the Shivaya Dawah Zendigi, Yani Sorry. It, is, it is being uh, brought about by the style of life. So this is the way they live. So let's say Afghanistan or Afghanistan. Saudi Arabia or Qatar. Yeah. I mean, these are... Yeah. And is, this is not as good or bad. It's not about what is a different. For example, I want to only shift a little bit before that. When the uh, movement started in Iran, Woman Life Freedom, we had a huge... Uh, attack from the outside Iran yes. about the, ah, they are the, they are the Isl Islamic phobia. They want yeah, to take the hijab, you yeah. know, because they want to against the Islam, you know. And, and you know, lots of friends outside, when I speak with them, they say, no, we cannot speak about this. This is Islamic phobia, you know. This is uh, against. 
And you know, it's the it's take a long time to people understand this is not about Islam, the revolution in Iran, not about the when you take the hijab, that means you you are uh, anti Islamic. Islam, yeah. You're not. That's the weirdest thing I think is that you're right. Yeah. Islam in Iran is cultural and family. Yeah. And there are families that have young women who have taken off the hijab and their grandmothers and mothers wear the hijab. There was another conversation that was related to me by someone who's just come that um, we know artists and artists have daughters. And one artist was talking about how every time her daughter leaves the house, she's very worried because her daughter not only refuses to wear the hijab, that, yes, they understand that, but the young will no longer even wear a scarf around their neck. So if they're stopped by the authorities, they can flip the scarf up and say, Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah, fell look, down. It fell down. No, they're not going back. But they're still very devoted. To, to culturally, they're Persian and they're Islamic. Their family is culturally Persian and Islamic. And I find that the, these discussions that have been taking place in mainly what I've been seeing, American Muslim circles, that somehow this, the women in Iran are not Islamic, this idea that there's, you're either religious with a hijab or you're religious you, you're irreligious without the hijab. It's very binary. It's a very stiff idea of how people and women, how people behave. And I think that's really a problem. Um, in the book, uh, we have a, a, a very interesting um, interview with Pamela Karimi, who's a, a well-known art historian. And she talks about the problems in America how people have been looking at the hijab as the measure of how religious are you. And I think it, it, I, I think it, it you know, this binary stuff well, is a problem. I must say that this from my own personal experience, when I was in Zanzibar at the time when Women Life Freedom happened, and I, they're 99% Muslim, 95% Muslim there, and I have a very good friend, Abraham, and he was absolutely gutted that I was talking about the Islamic Republic. And one thing I found, and this is when I've traveled in different uh, Islamic countries, they actually look up to Iran. And a Lebanese chap also, again in Zanzibar, said, why don't you have running water? Don't you have electricity? And I went, are you kidding me? We have enough money for all of that. So we have this really big problem where, unfortunately, the Islamic Republic seems to be held up as an example of a successful nation. They're only successful because they're so rich. They're not successful because anyone's managing it well. As a matter of fact, they're scraping 95% of the wealth off, and only 5% is reaching the people. But there is this perception that Iran, in Egypt I've heard it, in Lebanon I've heard it, People look up and go, oh, look, an Islamic Republic that is still successful, that is still there. And it's almost at any cost. And this actually brings me to this woman life freedom. The whole context of that was t Kurdish women. I mean, amongst the Kurd, I know that this whole Iran uh, woman life freedom was a bit ethnicized, but it had nothing to do with her being a Kurdish woman. She could have been Azari, she could have been... Baluchi, Iranian, she could have been of any ethnic group. She just got really unlucky. But this whole idea of like, um, it's just really, it is, it does sort of get uh, confusing. Now I've lost my track of thought. No, I wanted this, to, that's, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 well, No, no, it is, yeah. What's really interesting is that when I was doing books in, uh, you know, I guess over 10 years or a decade ago, Iranians didn't talk about the diversity of their country. Now, I hear so much about, like, Iranians talk about uh, that there, there are Afghani, uh, Afghan Iranians, Arab Iranians, Lures, Baluchistan, it, 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 and, and, you, and uh, uh, you also see it, I mean, I'm getting really excited, there, I, I really like Iranian hip-hop. I don't know if you, have you been listening to Iranian hip-hop? Yes. Iranian, and, and you know, of course, Tumaj Salihi, but also, you know, Justina, 
and also there's a, 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 a video out on YouTube where you have rappers from all over Iran rapping in their dialects. Some of them even dress up in their, in their region's dress. And I mean, when I saw that video, I like, I, 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 I'm so, diversity, so interesting. I learned through the photographs of Tamane Mozavi of African Iranians who were brought by the Arab slave traders who live in Baluchistan and Sistan. They live well, there. Well, we've got a longer history than that. When a the Achaemenids built the first, the Suez canals, they actually had uh, Egyptians building and they site them. So we actually have a very ancient black presence in a southern very, Iran. Yes. But when the Portuguese arrived is when actually they're the ones who bought wholesale sale slavery. The Arab traders, we didn't have such a thing as slavery. We had serfdom. So it's a slightly different slightly discussion different. there. But this, uh, what I was going to say about woman life freedom. So Let's woman life, ask, yes, add please. something to this. Please. You know, you said the Mahsa Jina I Amini, mean, she was from the minority of the Kurdish people. It's, it's very more, she's, she's a uh, very young girl. And you know when, to, yeah, when they arrest her, her brother said they, walk, they come to Tehran, the capital of Iran, to visit the capital for the first time in their life, you know? And they arrest her. And the brother said to the police, we are here a visitor, we are a stranger here, you know, we are from the Kurdish people. And yeah, and then that happened to her. And you cannot believe for the first, I also come from the Arab minority, then we can speak about the minority in Iran, you know. You cannot believe the Iranian people, everyone saw Mahsa, she's like a guest in that city, and she could be one, of, and she's innocent, she's not political, she's not, not anything else, you know. But what has happened, two things happened, I think, this moment, movement in the start go very powerful up. First, the innocent of the Mahsa, that is the first thing, really, because everyone found that could happen to, to my girl, you know. The second thing is the, the, the like arrangement of the uh, woman in Tehran in that few days when she was be in the in the hospital, and then the Kurdish, the Kurdish help that is like a make this uh, movement in the start is like a very uh, give the, organized because that's what I think maybe I'm wrong. No, I think you're right. Because they was being. Uh, for many years fighting the government, you know. They are like, a, they had a party. We don't have a party in Iran when you say party as a party for, like here, you know. It's all, is like a, a, but they really have a opposition party, you know. And they start to like uh, organize everything because the first days everyone don't know what happened also the opposition outside Iran, inside Iran. But they are very, very fast make it like uh, organized and then start and, that way. And also who documented a lot of what was going on was Harana, which is a Kurdish human rights organization that publishes online. A lot of the news that were, you could read in Iran Wire, eventually that news would be picked up by the international press. You could follow it back to Harana's website, the, the reports that they made about the first, I think, the, not the first 100 days, but maybe the first 200 days yeah, yeah. of the protests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that a Kurdish uh, human rights stroke activist journalist group, they were the ones that were the, the, the source. And, and, yeah. well, you see, what, what I was going to say is that woman life freedom was actually a term that came out from the Kurdish fighters because whilst you have uh, the Kurdish are just as bad, no offence, with being patriarchal in their society, yes. they're actually quite tough on their women. However, Kurdish women are one of the only women from South and West Asia who are 
absolutely incorporated into the army. And this was woman life freedom was actually something they sung to make a point of to the men about their society. And then when ISIS came, this took on a whole other meaning. So for me, this you see this patriarchal Islamic social society, they are they feel very jeopardized by this whole woman yeah. life freedom, which is why for me, I feel a bit sad because I don't think we're going to get too far, no offense, but uh, you think we are. So tell me about one thing in the book is about how the world, a white woman life freedom movement is a revolution made by art, because I think that's a really key point with this movement. It was, it was interesting that the protests were going on and the artists were also galvanized and you had all this, you had all the moving image on, on, on you know, social media. And then you had the artists putting in images uh, so that they could be disseminated. And, you know, they talked about in um, the, the Arab Spring 2011, uh, the revolution in Tahrir Square was the uh, Twitter revolution because it was through Twitter. But really, this revolution, and, and people do call it a revolution, woman life freedom. They don't really, they don't think of it as a movement. They call it a revolution. They see it as, it, it, it really had traction on social media, but Instagram was very important. I, I'll confess, I'm a Luddite. I'm, I, you know, come on, new technology, I have trouble with it. I, I just, I like, I think within the last, because I'm, I'm a, the literary editor of, a, of the Marquez Review, I tweet now about my writers and what we're doing at the Marquez Review. But um, Ferry Bradley, the experimental sound artist, she came to my house, she said, if you're going to do this book, you've got to get on Instagram. You can't do the book and not be on Instagram. And so she got me on Instagram. And I noticed that if I needed to talk to an artist, if I needed, if I had a question for the socialist graffiti collective in Tehran, uh, and their name is Kiaban Tribune, I wrote them through Instagram, and they answered me within a half hour. Like uh, that's how I was able to negotiate my way with the artists. And um, I will say, with the arts, we are not just talking about visual arts because music clearly played music a massive. So part in this whole thing and what did you find? Yeah, no, I found that is, this is, <laughs> she said, is the art uh, movement. I say this is the social media's movement, you know. I found that is really, without social media, is it nothing happen. happened. This is the really social media movement. That's why, you know, it's, yeah. So it kind of shows, yeah. like, when we talk about technology, yeah. Yeah. we worry about surveillance. Yeah that there is an, an alternative way yeah. to hit back. Yeah, exactly. there, th it's like, it's not all doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. People find a way, they find a way through the cracks. Yeah. And then, you know, we were talking about how we are, this is uh, different various societies that are hit by this whole thing and the outpourings. We didn't have Vali Mahluji here today because he had COVID. So I would like to just share with you some of the things that are their findings. There is an axis of resistance which is operating in Iran, Iraq, and Lebanon, and they perpetuate and organize violent anti-LGBTQ plus hate campaigns and mob attacks. Uh, you also have in Iraq uh, the Communications and Media Commission, commission has declared homosexuals as sexual deviants. Uh, we have a really big problem that we need legislation for for LGBTQ rights, and then this issue of like. Um, Public awareness, unfortunately, it's not just outside, it's inside Iran. We need to change the attitudes of Iranians, Iraqis, Middle Easterners about LGBTQ issues inside and outside Iran. So this is the one thing that struck me. So this fight is not just within the country. It's, we have to change the way Iranians outside think, because I know many people who are in the closet from the region, because even though they live here, they can't fully come out. So I'm really sad that we couldn't have Vali here to talk more about that. But can can yeah? I quote him? Yes. Vali said that, that it, he felt that woman life freedom, there's a, you know, there's a real queer undercurrent to the movement, to the revolution, and that he felt that it was a feminizing 
it was a it wasn't just a feminist revolution it was a feminizing revolution that had space for everybody else to come in so it's not just about women it's it's It's, it, it is about so many different sectors yeah. of society, and unfortunately, the issues can't all be addressed. And it is outside the country as well, because you mention how backlash against what goes on in Iran ends up mirroring outside. It's a very weird, uneasy dialogue and debate and argument that seems to be constantly going on. Now, what I'm going to do in the last 10 minutes is open up for any of you if you have any questions from our. Yeah. 